Chapter Thirteen of Murder at Bridge. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Murder at Bridge by Anne Austin. Chapter Thirteen. I'll read you the note, Lydia, but I can't let you touch it. Dundee said sternly taking good care that she should not touch either the paper on which the note to herself had been written, or the sheet which contained that strange informal will. Informal, in spite of the dead woman's obvious effort to couch it in legal phraseology. Was Lydia's frenzy assumed? Did she hope to leave fingerprints now, which would account for fingerprints she had already left upon it? Was it not possible that Lydia's had been the prying fingers which had opened the envelope, after Nita Selim had sealed it, with God only knew what fears in her heart. If so, Lydia Carr had found that she was her mistress's sole legatee. Revenge, coupled with greed, what better motive for murder could a detective ask? And who had had so good an opportunity as Lydia Carr to dispose of the weapon? The woman crouched back on her haunches, an agony of pleading in her single eye. "'Lydia, I think you know already what this note tells you,' Dundee said slowly. To his astonishment the maid nodded, the tears starting again. "'I asked her once what she wanted to keep that old dress for, and she—' "'She said, I'd find out some day, but I never dreamed she'd want it for a—oh, my God, for a shroud!' For the second time that evening Lydia Carr completely routed Dundee's carefully worked-up case against her. It was inconceivable, he told himself, that a mind cunning enough to have executed this murder would give itself away in such a fashion. If she had indeed pried among her mistress's papers and found the will and note, would she not, from the most primitive instinct of self-preservation, have pretended total ignorance of the note's contents? "'I'll read the note, Lydia,' he said gently. "'It is addressed, my precious old Lydia.' She was always calling me that, the maid sobbed. And she writes, If you ever read this, it will be because I am dead. And you'll know that I've tried to make it up to you the only way I knew. I never could believe you really forgave me, but maybe you will now. And there is one last thing I want you to do for me, Lydia, darling. You remember that old royal blue velvet dress of mine that you were always sniffing at, and either trying to make me give away or have made over? and remember that I told you that you'd know some time why I'd kept it. Well, I want you to lay me out in it, Lydia. Such a funny old-fashioned shroud, isn't it? But with dresses long again, maybe it won't look so funny, and there'll be nobody but you and Lois to see me in it, because I've said so in my will. And I want my hair dressed as it was the only time I ever wore the royal blue velvet, a French roll, Lydia, with curls coming out the left side of it, and hanging down to the left ear. You brush the hair straight up the back of the head, gather it together, and tie a little bit of black shoestring around it. Then you twist the hair into a roll, and spread it high, pinning it down on each side of the head. And don't forget the little curls on the left side. I hope I have enough hair. But if it hasn't grown long enough, you know where those switches are that I had made when I first bobbed my hair. You won't mind touching me when I'm dead, will you, Lydia? I do love you, Nita. Dundee was silent for a minute, after he had finished reading the strange note, and had returned it to the envelope, along with the will. At last, speaking against a lump in his throat, he broke in on the desolate sobbing of Nita's maid. Lydia, how old was your mistress? You won't put it in the papers, will you? Lydia pleaded. She, she was thirty-three but not a soul knew it except me. And will you tell me how old the royal blue velvet dress is? He continued. Also, how long since girls dressed their hair in a French roll? The dress is twelve or thirteen years old, Lydia said, her voice dull now with grief. I know, because I used to do dressmaking during the war, and it was during the war that the girls wore their hair that way. I did mine, in a psych knot, but the French roll was more stylish. Did your mistress ever tell you about the one time she wore the dress? Lydia shook her head. No, she wouldn't talk about it. 
just said I'd know some time why she kept it. Royal blue velvet, it is, the skirt halfway to the ankle, and sleeves with long, pointed ends, lined with gold taffeta, and finished off with gold tassels. It's in a dress-bag hanging in her closet. Do you think it was her wedding dress, Lydia? Dundee suggested, the idea suddenly flashing into his mind. I don't know. I didn't ask her that. Lydia denied dully. Can I take it with me, and the switches she had made of her curls? I'll have to get authority to remove anything from the house, Lydia, Dundee told her. But I am sure you will be permitted to follow Mrs. Selim's instructions. So you're going to accept the Miles' offer as a job as nurse? Yes, I'd rather work. Mr. and Mrs. Miles have always been specially nice to me, and I, I could love their children. They're not afraid of me. Perhaps you're wise, Dundee agreed. By the way, Lydia, did Mrs. Selim have a pistol in her possession at any time during the past week? The maid shook her head. Not that I seen, and if she got one because she was afraid, she'd a kept it handy, and I'd a been bound to see it. Convinced of her sincerity, he was about to let her go pack her bag when another belated question occurred to him. Lydia, will you tell me what engagements Mrs. Selim had this last week? The woman scowled, fanatically jealous, Dundee guessed of her mistress's reputation, but at last she answered defiantly, "'Let me see. Mr. Sprague had Sunday dinner here, and spent the afternoon, but Sunday night it was young Mr. Ralph Hammond. He came whenever she'd let him. Monday night? Oh, yes. She had dinner at the country club with the Mileses and the Drakes and the Dunlaps. Mr. Miles brought her home because Mr. Sprague wasn't invited.' Tuesday night. Let me think. Yes, that's the night Judge Marshall was here. Nita had sent for him to talk about finishing up the attic. So that was the business engagement which Judge Marshall had hemmed and hawed over. Dundee reflected triumphantly. And Wednesday night, Lydia was continuing, with a certain pride in her mistress's popularity. She was at a dinner party at the Dunlaps. Did Mr. Peter Dunlap ever call on Mrs. Selim alone? Him? Lydia was curiously resentful. He wasn't ever here. Nita said to me she wished Mr. Peter liked her as well as Miss Lois did. Thursday night? Mr. Ralph Hammond took her somewhere to dinner, to some other town, I think. But I wasn't awake when they got home. Nita would never let me sit up for her. Said I needed my rest. So I always went to bed early. "'And yesterday, Friday?' demanded Dundee tensely, for Friday she had been driven to making her last will and testament. "'She was home all day. About half-past four Mr. Drake came,' Lydia said slowly, as if she too were wondering. "'She was awfully restless. Couldn't sit still or eat. I ought to have suspicioned something, but she was often like that, lately. Mr. Drake stayed about an hour, but I didn't see him leave.' because I was cooking Nita's dinner. But little good it did, because she didn't eat it. So there was plenty for Mr. Sprague when he dropped in about seven. Did Mr. Sprague spend the evening? I guess so, but I don't know. Nita made me take the Ford and drive into town for a picture show. She was in bed when I got back, and— But she checked herself hastily. Did Nita seem strange, troubled, excited? Did she look as if she had been crying? Dundee prodded. I didn't see her, the maid acknowledged. I knocked on her door, but she told me to go on to bed, that she wouldn't need me, but now I think back. Her voice sounded queer. Maybe she was crying, but I don't know. And this morning? She seemed all right, just excited about the party, and worried about my tooth. Mr. Ralph Hamm had come to make the estimates on finishing up the top floor, and we left him here. What was her attitude towards Mr. Miles when he dropped in on her this morning? Dundee interrupted. Mr. Miles? Lydia echoed, frowning. He wasn't here this morning, or if he was, it was after Nita and I had left for town. While the maid was packing a bag, which Dundee would examine before she was allowed to take it away with her, the detective rejoined Tracy Miles, who had made himself as comfortable as possible in the living room. Lydia is going with you, and is grateful for your wife's kindness. Dundee informed him, and felt his heart warm 
to the boresome, egotistical, little cherub of a man when he saw how Miles's face lit up with real pleasure. By the way, Miles, you saw Ralph Hammond when you called here this morning, didn't you? Yes, Miles answered with some reluctance. He answered the door when I rang and told me Lydia and Eda had gone to town. Mr. Miles, Dundee began slowly, throwing friendliness and persuasion into his voice. I know how all you folk stick together, but I'd appreciate it a lot if you'd tell me frankly whether you'd noticed anything unusual in Hammond's manner this morning. Unusual? Miles repeated, frowning. He was a little short with me, because he was busy, and I suspect a little jealous because I'd come calling on Nita. He broke off abruptly in obvious distress. Look here, Dundee. I didn't mean to say that, but I suppose you'll find out sooner or later. Well, the fact is, the whole crowd knows Ralph Hammond was absolutely mad about Nita Selim, wanted to marry her, and made no secret of it, though we all thought or hoped it would be little Penny Crane. He's been devoted to Penny for years, and since Roger Crane made a mess of things and skipped out, leaving Penny and her poor mother high and dry, we've all done our best to throw Penny and Ralph together, but since Nita came to town— "'Was Nita in love with Ralph?' Dundee cut in rather curtly, for he had a curious distaste for hearing Penny Crane discussed in this manner. "'Sometimes we were sure she was,' Miles answered. "'She flirted with all us men, had a way with her of making every man she talked to think he was the only pebble on the beach. But there was something special in the way she looked at Ralph. Yes, I think she was in love with him. But then again,' he frowned. "'She would treat him like a dog.' seemed to want to drive him away from her. But she always called him back. Oh, Lord! He interrupted himself with a groan. Now I suppose I have put my foot in it. You've got the damnedest way of making a chap tell everything. He would cut his tongue out rather than spill. Dundee. But just because a young man's in love, and happens not to show up at a party, is no reason to think. He sneaked up to the house and killed the woman he loved and wanted to marry. "'for I'm not so dumb that I haven't seen the drift of your damnable questions, Dundee. "'Do you know Ralph Hammond by any chance?' "'He concluded, his round face red with anger. "'No, but I should like to meet him,' Dundee retorted. "'He seems quite hard to locate this evening.' "'Well, when you do meet him,' Tracy Miles began violently, "'his blue eyes blazing with anger, "'you'll soon find you've been barking up the wrong tree. "'There's not a cleaner, finer, straighter—' "'In fact, he is a friend of yours, Miles,' Dundee answered soothingly. "'And I respect you for every word you've said. "'By the way, did all of you go to the country club for dinner after you left here?' "'Somewhat mollified, Miles answered. "'All of us but Clive Hammond. "'He said he was going to have a look around for Ralph himself. "'Seemed to have an idea where he might find him. "'And, oh, yes, Sprague disappeared in the scramble. "'He hasn't a car, and nobody thought of offering him a lift. "'Guess he took a bus into Hamilton. Ah. "'Here's Lydia. Hello, Lydia.' He called heartily to the woman who was standing, tall and gaunt, in the doorway. "'Mighty glad you're coming to look after the kids.' From behind the black veil which draped her ugly black hat and hid her scarred face, Lydia answered in the dull, harsh voice that was characteristic of her. "'Thank you, sir. I'll do my best.' She made no protest when Dundee, with a word of embarrassed apology, went rapidly through the heavy suitcase she brought up from the basement with her. And when he had finished his fruitless search, she knelt and silently smoothed the coarse, utilitarian garments he had disarranged. Five minutes later Dundee was alone in the house, where murder had been committed under such strange and baffling circumstances that afternoon. He was not nervous, but again he made a tour of inspection on the first floor and basement, looking into closets, and testing windows to make sure they were all locked. Everywhere there were evidences of the thoroughness of the police detectives who had searched for the weapon with which Nita Selim had been murdered. In the basement, as he had subconsciously noted on his headlong dash to question Lydia Carr, the furnace doors swung open, and the lids of the laundry tubs had been left propped up, after the unavailing search. He plodded wearily up the basement stairs and on into the kitchen. Perhaps the ice-box had something fit to eat in it, the fruit intended for Nita's and Lydia's Sunday breakfast. Those caviar and anchovy sandwiches had certainly not stuck with him long. He was making his way towards the electric refrigerator when he stopped as suddenly as if he had been shot. 
the kitchen door which he had taken especial pains to assure himself was locked when he had made the rounds immediately after the departure of captain strawn and his men was standing slightly ajar some one had entered this house dundee stared blankly at the door which was equipped with a yale lock some one with a key but why had the door been left ajar to make escape more noiseless with the toe of his shoe dundee pushed the door to and heard the click of the lock then all thought of food routed from his mind made a quick but almost silent dash into the dining-room to secure one of the pair of tall wax tapers which in their silver candlesticks served as ornaments for the sideboard if the intruder was still in the house he could be nowhere but in that unfinished half of the gabled top story the nearer stairs were those in the back hall and dundee took them two at a time regardless of the noise who had preceded him stealthily by the aid of his lighted candle he discovered an electric switch at the head of the stairs flicked it on and found himself in a wide hall one wall of which was finished with buff tinted plaster and with three doors the other of rough boards with but a single door with his candle held high so that its light should not blind him and well aware that it made him a perfect target dundee opened the unpainted door and found himself in the dark musty-smelling room that had served nita selim and the cranes before her as a storeroom from the ceiling dangled a green cord ending in a cheap clear glass bulb but its light was sufficient to penetrate even the furthest low nooks made by these three gables he blew out his candle and dropped it as useless now a quick tour convinced him that nothing human was concealed behind one of nita selim's empty wardrobe trunks or behind one of the several pieces of heavy old furniture undoubtedly left behind by the dispossessed crane family big footprints on the thick dust which coated the floor showed them that he had been no more thorough than captain strawn's brace of plain-clothes detectives had been much earlier that evening two pairs of giant footprints with an exclamation he discovered a smaller narrower pair of prints and followed their winding trail all around and across the attic and then he remembered ralph hammond's footprints of course made that morning as he went about his legitimate business of measuring and estimating for the job of turning the storeroom into bedrooms and bathrooms dundee had not realized that he was frightened until he was in the hall again facing one of the three doors in the plastered wall with surprise and some amusement he became aware that his hands were trembling and that his knees had a curious tendency to buckle the fact that the door directly in front of him was open about two inches served for some odd reason to steady his nerves pushing the door wide open with his foot for he never forgot the possibility of incriminating fingerprints which might easily be obliterated he discovered a light switch near the door frame the instant illumination from a ceiling cluster revealed a large bedroom and less clearly another and smaller room beyond it facing as the house faced towards the south knees and hands steady again he investigated the finished portion of the gable story swiftly a charming layout he told himself had penny crane once enjoyed this delightful little sitting-room with its tiny balcony built out upon the sloping roof and it gave him pleasure to think that this big well-furnished but not fussily feminine bedroom had once been hers as well as the small but perfect bathroom whose high narrow window overlooked the back garden the closets dresser drawers and highboy drawers were completely empty however of any traces of her occupancy or that of any other with these rooms going to waste why he suddenly asked himself had nita selim coaxed judge marshall to have the unfinished half of the gabled attic turned into bedrooms and baths why couldn't lydia have slept up here if nita thought so much of her faithful and beloved maid but even as he asked himself the question dundee realized that the answer to it had been struggling to attract his attention these rooms had not been wasted someone had been occupying them as late as last night weaving swiftly through the three rooms like a bloodhound on the scent dundee collected the few but sufficient proofs to back up his intuitive conviction a copy of the hamilton evening sun dated friday may twenty third left in an armchair in the sitting-room 
all windows raised about six inches from the bottom so that the night breeze stirred the hand-blocked linen drapes and clinging to these drapes the faint but unmistakable odor of cigarette smoke finally with a low cry of triumph bonnie dundee flung back the colored linen spread which covered the three-quarter bed and discovered that the sheets and pillowcases though clean had beyond a shadow of a doubt been slept upon bending so that his nose almost touched a pillowcase he sniffed pomade who was the man who had slept in this bed last night End of chapter 13